All right, we are finishing up our blood evidence lesson. This is lesson three in our series of talking about blood evidence. So if you haven't already watched lessons one and two, go back and do that first. Um, but today we're just expanding on blood spatter. We started talking about this in lesson two, and today we're going to tie in some more physics concepts with regards to blood spatter. Now, when a wound is inflicted and blood leaves the body, we have a spatter pattern that might be created on different surfaces at the crime scene. And crime scene investigators are going to try to analyze those blood patterns. Blood stain analysis is what this is called. Now, this technique is not anything new. It's been around for a while, but it's still very helpful to investigators. So we talked about in, in lesson two, the fact that blood stain analysis is different from any of the other types of evidence that we've talked about so far. So fingerprints, DNA, fibers, hair, those pieces of evidence try to point to a person. They try to narrow down the suspect field. Blood stain interpretation is going to help tell the story behind what took place at the crime scene. So it is still very useful to investigators. It does take a trained investigator to be able to identify blood stains and what they mean, uh, but it is a process that is very helpful to uh, crime scene investigation. So given blood spatter patterns, it's possible to determine what we call directionality. We introduced this term in lesson two uh, which is just telling the investigator where the blood was traveling, where it came from. Uh, they can learn something called the angle of impact and ideally the point of origin for the blood stain. So angle of impact and point of origin are new terms. We're going to talk about those today. Angle of impact is going to be useful in determining point of origin, which is where a person or object was when they lost the blood that eventually hit a surface. All right, so directionality can be determined by analyzing the tail of the blood stain or lack thereof. So by tail, let me hop over one slide. By tail, you can see here on the left, we have a like a circular shaped blood stain, whereas on the right, we have more of an elongated blood stain and we have what's called a tail off the end of the blood stain. So investigators are going to be able to use this tail to tell the tail. So if you'll just remember, the tail tells the tail. Investigators use that tail to determine directionality. Now, if they can determine where the blood was traveling, where, then they can work backwards and determine where the blood came from. And that could be helpful in their investigation. So we've talked about the tail. Um, if there is no horizontal motion to the blood, then it's going to fall as a spherical drop. And we know this this is because of gravity. We learned this in, in lesson two. Now, the size and appearance of these stains do depend on a number of factors. So, for example, the volume of blood that was lost, the surface that the blood drop falls on, um, whether or not a secondary drop falls on an existing drop, all of those factors create different patterns. So, we see here uh, that if blood falls at a 90 degree angle, it's going to create a circular shape. We call this a passive stain or a gravitational drop, uh, and it's not going to have a tail. So if investigators notice a stain that looks similar to this one here, more circular in shape, then they know it fell at a 90 degree angle. Uh, so this could be from a dripping weapon or a hand that's covered in blood or soaked in blood, and it's just kind of dripping blood. Uh, this could be from a nosebleed. So you can see more circular shape closer to 90 degree angle. When you start to have a more elongated shape or a tail, that means that the blood struck a surface at an angle. There was horizontal motion. And investigators use that tail to determine directionality. So you can see the tail tells the tail. The tail will tell investigators where the blood was traveling or the direction that the blood was traveling. You can also get quantitative measurements from blood. So you can get measurements like length and width, and you can use those. You can plug those into formulas to find angle of impact. We're going to do that towards the end of the lesson.
Now I do want to point out here with this passive stain, one thing I want you to notice is it is not a perfect circle. So you will notice some what's called spikes or spines, which kind of jut out from the initial blood stain. Uh, those are still attached to the original stain. And then you have what's called satellites, which are independent of the stain, but they still were um, part of the original blood stain. So satellites are independent, spikes and spines are attached to the blood drop. Now we learned in lesson two that blood stains can be classified by their velocity. So the speed that the blood was traveling when it hit a surface. Uh, you can have high velocity spatter, medium velocity spatter, and low velocity spatter. So let's take a look at some examples. So this is an example of low velocity spatter. Investigators can look at this and tell that this blood was dropped at a 90 degree angle. So this is a passive drop or a gravitational drop. You can see here there are some spikes and spines. There are a few satellites. Okay. Um, I want you to notice here uh, where one drop existed and then a second drop gave energy to the existing drop and you have some satellites that were formed. So when blood falls on top of blood, the new energy gives energy to the original blood stain and it produces more uh, satellites and spikes. Now these stains are going to look different depending on the surface that they were dropped on. So if blood is dropped on a smooth surface, you have more of a circular pattern. If these passive drops were dropped on something like concrete or something more porous, you may have more spikes and spines. So investigators know this. Now a medium velocity spatter is going to be traveling a little bit faster than low velocity spatter when it hits a surface. And so you can see this spatter is a little more elongated. It's coming in at an angle. Um, investigators can identify this as medium, medium velocity spatter. And then high velocity spatter typically is going to be more of a spray. You're going to have tiny droplets less than a millimeter in diameter. Uh, and so this is what high velocity spatter would look like. And this just means that a lot of energy was behind that blood when it hit a surface. I do want to go back a few slides. Um, the angle at which a blood drop hits a surface can help investigators determine where a person was when they lost blood. And there is, again, a formula for that. We're going to talk about that towards the end of the lesson. But you can see here, the more circular shape, the closer to 90 degrees. Um, the further we move from 90, that 90 degree angle, the more elongated the blood gets and it has more of a tail. So again, the tail tells the tail. I um, mean, you can see here the comparison between blood that hit a surface at a 10 degree angle as compared to blood that hit a surface at a 90 degree angle. Right, so um, if you are in my class, we did an activity where we saw the relationship between the height from which blood falls and the diameter of the spatter pattern that's created. So there is a direct correlation between the height from which blood falls and the size of the blood stain. So typically with greater heights, we get larger blood stains. So the rule is uh, the as height increases, from which the blood falls, diameter also increases, but there is a trick. So I want you to take a look at this graph. So we can see as height increases, the diameter of the blood stain increases, but notice what happens around seven feet. Around seven feet, the diameter of the blood stain stays fairly constant. Um, so you can see that in this picture too, as height increases, the diameter of the passive blood stain increases. Now we don't see any pictures after seven feet, um, and that's because after seven feet, usually uh, the blood, the diameter levels off. So just some physics behind this, velocity does increase when drops fall from greater heights, but that only happens until the drop reaches what we call terminal velocity. So once the drop maxes out its speed or reaches terminal velocity, once that point is reached, 
the patterns are going to appear to be the same diameter regardless of height. And we can see from the chart here that usually happens around seven feet, give or take. All right, now investigators, when they're working a crime scene and they have blood spatter, all they need is two drops. So if they've got two drops of blood spatter, they can use something called stringing uh, to help sort of paint a picture of what took place. So in order to determine point of origin, which is the ultimate goal, they want to know where a person was standing when they lost blood or where an object was located when it slung blood on the ceiling. Um, so they want to determine point of origin. Investigators are going to use stringing, which is a method to figure this out. And they're going to have to first find the area of convergence. And then they're going to use the area of convergence to, to calculate or figure out the point of origin. Now that's a lot of vocabulary, I know. But we're going to walk through step by step. And I'm going to bring up all of this. One thing I want to point out the difference between area of convergence and point of origin. So you have to be able to figure out area of convergence first before you can figure out the point of origin. Point of origin is the ultimate goal. Point of origin is a three-dimensional view, whereas area of convergence is two-dimensional. Okay, So keep that in mind as we go through. So if I'm an investigator and I'm working a crime scene, I've got a few blood spatters, um, blood stains on, let's say, a wall, okay? I'm going to use a process known as stringing to help me determine uh, point of origin. So investigators are going to start by looking for spatter with directionality. So they're going to look for spatter that has that tail. Um, so if I see a couple of spatters like this, I'm going to use that tail to help me tell the tail. And what they're going to do is they're going to place string right down the long axis of those spatters. Okay, so you can see in the picture, they, they're going to cut string, they're going to run string down the long axis of the spatters, and then where those strings start to intersect, this is called the area of convergence. It's a two-dimensional view. Now, we can't gather too much information here, but we have to know this in order to determine the next part, which is point of origin. Okay, so you can see um, where the stringing's been done, um, where they start to converge or intersect, this is the area of convergence. And once investigators have that, they're going to use some trig, and they're going to determine the angle of impact. Now, for a science class, this might seem a little intimidating, but it's not bad at all, promise, especially if you have a calculator. So make sure you have a calculator. Make sure that calculator is set to degrees. Okay, very important. All right, so what investigators are going to do is they are going to measure the length of the stain and the width of the stain, and they're going to use that information to plug it into this formula. So angle of impact is going to be equal to the inverse sine of the width divided by the length. So I'm going to take the width of the blood stain, divide that by the length of the blood stain, get that calculation, and then take the inverse sign of that number, that's going to give me the angle, the angle of impact. All right, so let's practice one together. All right, so let's say I give you this blood spatter pattern on your next quiz. Um, we determine that the length of the blood stain is three centimeters. The width is one and a half centimeters. You're going to use this formula. So you're going to plug in 1.5 divided by three, you're going to get that answer, and then you're going to take the inverse sine of that answer, okay, which is going to give you about 30 degrees. So this tells me that this blood stain, when it hit a surface, it came in at a 30 degree angle. Now, if I'm an investigator and I see this stain, first of all, I'm going to notice that it's pretty circular. So my guess is this is a passive drop or a gravitational drop. It means it's going to be pretty close to a 90 degree angle. But if I want to do some math to check, check that out, I could. All right, so if I have the length at 6 millimeters and the height of this blood stain at 6 millimeters, we can plug it into our formula. So 6 divided by 6 is going to be 1, and the inverse sine of 1 is going to be 
you guessed it, 90 degrees. Okay, so this did in fact hit the surface at a 90 degree angle. So it's really not bad. Just make sure, um, the hardest part of this is making sure your calculator is set up for um, do it taking the inverse sine. And then a uh, good rule of thumb for most calculators is to just do width divided by length um, and then take the inverse sign of that. And then again, make sure that your calculator is set to degrees. Now, once investigators have that angle of impact, remember, let me go back. So remember um, previously they did stringing. They used the stringing method to figure out area of convergence. Now they've got that. They've taken a couple of drops. They've plugged it into this formula. They figured out the angle. And then what they're going to do is they're going to use a protractor and they're going to pull these strings back to that angle to determine where the person was standing when they lost that blood. Okay, so you can see here they have a device. They're going to use a protractor. They're going to pull each of these strings back to that angle. And then this lets the investigators know this is where the person was when they lost blood. Or this is where the suspect was standing with a bloody knife when um, that knife slung blood on the wall. Okay, so a lot, of different, a lot of different story angles here. But that's the job of the investigators to figure that out. All right, we're going to stop here. Um, and that ends our blood evidence lesson.